We are um, live streaming on YouTube this morning as well as Facebook and Sermon Audio. And uh, those of you watching, um, here's, here's what I'd like for you to do is um, Facebook is a shareable feed, which means that you can share it with your friends on your friend list. It'll show up on your news feed. And I don't have the exact um, address for the YouTube feed, but it also is a shareable feed. You can share it with um, your YouTube family. You can share it via Twitter. You can share it via Facebook. You can share it any number of ways. You can actually embed. If you have a website, you can actually embed uh, the YouTube channel. Um, into your website. and It'll show up on your website. And um, what my interest is, my interest is in people hearing or having the opportunity to hear the Word of God. Even if it's only one time, okay? Give them that chance. Give them the opportunity to hear the Word of God and let God do with His Word what God does with His Word. Amen? God's better at it than we are. Genesis chapter 3 Let's go <clears throat> and understand we are, we are based out of 2 Corinthians 11. And the phrase is, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. And so we're going to study this morning. And for the next uh, 68 months, how the serpent beguiled Eve. Uh, we don't want to be ignorant of the serpent's ways. We don't want him to beguile us with his subtlety. Um, I don't know about you, but I've been lied to before. Okay? I've been lied to by people. I've been lied to by preachers. And uh, I just don't like being lied to. And I... What in the world? That was different. Anyway... I don't, like, um, I don't like saying anything that's not true. I know I'm not capable of telling the truth 100% of the time, but I sure like to minimize the damage if I can. So let's understand a little bit how the devil deceives. His modus operandi, his method of operation. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent. And uh, we have already studied this out uh, several weeks ago. The serpent is Satan. He is the dragon. He is the old devil. And uh, he is the deceiver. He is the um, accuser of the brethren. He is the roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is the thief that um, goeth about to kill and to destroy. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, and that is a question, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Question mark. Verse 2. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, um, God has said, ye shall not eat of it. And God did say that. Neither shall ye touch it. And God did not say that. He did not say that. They could have touched it. They could have picked the fruit. I guess they could have fed the fruit to the elephants, thrown the fruit. They could have climbed the tree, cut the branches off the tree, uh, made little necklaces out of the leaves if they wanted to. God did not tell them to don't go near the tree, don't touch the tree, don't climb the tree. God did not put a big fence around the tree saying no trespassing. God didn't do any of that. God left that tree open. And in the midst of the garden, and the other tree was in the midst of the garden, the tree of life. And it wasn't that God took the tree, 
put it up on top of a high mountain somewhere, deep in a cave, where nobody could get to it. He did not do that. He put it down right in the midst of the garden. I, I got somebody I want you to pray for, and I cannot tell you who it is. Okay? I've asked to keep this private. But a lady called me, and she was, she was bawling her eyes out. And she's worried about uh, her son. And she said, my son, you know, he grew up in church and grew up hearing good preaching, good teaching. He's learned the Bible, but he's at an age right now where he's questioning God. He's asking questions like, you know, why does God, why did God allow bad things to come into the world and for people to suffer when he could stop it? It's as if God is just letting a, a, a he wrote the script of a play and that is meant to amuse him, watching these people suffer and so on. And I counseled with this lady and I said, well, I said, I said, you raised your son up in church, right? And she said, yeah. I said, you taught him out of the Bible? And she said, yeah. Homeschooled him and did everything that we knew to do. And I said, I guarantee you, the enemy has come in at night and sowed tares in among the wheat. Okay? And that's what happens. I said, the tares, in, in your case, the good seed, the wheat, is what you've sown into his life. Because you want good things to come up out of, out of your child's life. And I said, there's things going on in his life that you don't know about. And I said, if you think about this, in Matthew 13, the enemy came in at night, not in broad daylight. He does not come in broad daylight. He does not want to be seen planting the tares. Why? Because then we would go, hey, get out of my garden, you snake, and shoot him. Okay, we would put a stop to it right then. He comes in at night. He tries to deceive people through his subtlety. He wants to implant ideas that are contrary to the Word of God. Now, let me say this. Everybody is susceptible to this. Everybody is. When I, when I left this church to go to Bible college, I was on my own. And I had to, for the first time, I had to work things out in my mind for myself. Before I left home, my mother told me what to think. My mother told me what to do. Our preacher told us what to believe. He taught us good and straight. And I was under that bubble of protection. But then when I left, the devil came in and sowed tares, seeds of thoughts that he hoped would choke out the good things that was sown into me. Almost worked. But God had put it in me to want to survive to want to live, to want to not go to hell. God put that in me. It's that survival instinct that we have. When we start to think about where the tares are going to lead us and where the wheat's going to lead us, and you decide that you don't want to go to hell, you want to keep living, you want life eternal, and there is only one way to go with life eternal, that is to follow God's way. And so at some point, the tares have to be gathered up and taken out. At some point, you start to sift out what's true, what's not true. Verses come to mind like, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That is you sitting down thinking, okay, now what's true and what's not true? What's real and what's not real? Um... Test the spirits to see whether they be of God. Okay? How do you do that? The Word of God is the testing mechanism. And so you start working your own mind out. You start thinking and, and sifting things out because both of them cannot abide in the same place at the same time. You cannot fully believe in God and His Word 
and then fully believe the subtle lies that you have been told about God. You can't do that. It ha it's either going to be one or the other. And that is, uh, that's this uh, lady that called me, that's her fear. Her fear is, is that she's going to lose her son. He's going to decide to just go off the deep end and, and go after things. But I told her, I said, at somehow, some way, he's getting ideas from this world without his mama knowing about it. Somebody is feeding things into his mind, seeding these ideas into his mind. And he's going to have to work these things out on his own. He's going to have to get it all fixed on what he's going to believe, what he's going to follow. But that's part of it. The first part is to get people to doubt. That's what he said. Yea, hath God said. The devil knows that in order to plant seeds of false doctrine, false teachings, false ways, he has got to cast doubt in your mind about what's in this book. Because like I said, you cannot believe 100% that everything in this Bible is true and then believe the lies that people tell you about God. You can't believe both of them. I'll give you an example. The Mormon church. The Mormon church has their Tuesday. They have the seed of the word of God, the King James Bible. They also have the tares, which is the book of Mormon. The Pearl of Great Price, the Doctrine and Covenants, all of those teachings. And then they have the, uh, the, the Council of the Twelve Apostles and the Chief Prophet, the Chief Apostle, that when he speaks, it's like God speaking. So they just kind of make it up as they go and whatever he says, that just trumps everything. That's kind of like Roman Catholicism. But they have both of those going. And here's the, here's the neat thing. The devil has used... The Mormon church to plant down these people's minds about the Word of God while they believe without any reservation that everything in the Book of Mormon is 100% true. They believe that there are mistakes in the King James Bible. Now, Scotty, I'm going to reel this out to you. I want you to understand this. 54 men working for seven years translating the Word of God into the King James Bible. They worked in a peer-reviewed fashion where each group monitored and proofread the work of the previous group. And they did that in a circular fashion. And then in areas where they weren't sure if they were translating right, they sent letters out to all the, um, all the ministers, all the scholars in the Kingdom of England, and invited them to give their input on how a certain passage should be translated. In other words, it was done in an open process so that everyone viewed everybody else's work. So they purified that book seven times. And when, when, when um, there were certain times when they would take what they translated, they would compare it with former translations like the Geneva Bible, like the Bishop's Bible, like uh, Martin Luther's Bible, Tyndale's Bible, Wycliffe's Bible the Old Latin Vulgate, and so on. They would compare it with earlier translations of the Bible just to make sure that they were keeping it right. Then you have Joseph Smith, who an angel told him that there was a book of golden plates buried in a hill in New York, gave him a secret location. Joseph Smith went alone and dug those plates up saw that they were written in what, what did they call it? Revised uh, hieroglyphics? It was a form of hieroglyphics that no one had ever seen before, written in a language that no one knew. And Joseph Smith was given a pair of special glasses that he called the Urim and the Thummim, and he had them in a hat, and he would sit and look at these golden plates with these special glasses on, translate it, and then write it out what he translated. Then the golden plates were taken back up to heaven and no one ever saw them. So the Mormons, this, this is their logic. 54 men plus all the former translations plus all of the scholars of England 
overseeing the work of the translation of the King James Bible, got it wrong. Joseph Smith, one man looking at golden plates that no one had ever seen, reading a language that no one understood, using glasses that no one else had, translated the entire Book of Mormon, and they say he got it right every time. That's the logic. But the devil plants, and the Mormons believe this, they don't believe the King James Bible when the King James disagrees with the Book of Mormon or the doctrines of the, church, of the uh, Mormon church. Okay? So, yea hath God said is sufficient. You have to plant doubt in people's minds. They have to, when they read it, they have to say, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if that's right or not, okay? I've been through that in my life. I've been there. I'm on the other side of that, and I don't read the Bible and say, I don't know if that's true or not. I read it and say, that's true. You okay? Are we keeping you awake, Ryan? Okay, all right. Long night, huh? Scooter kept you awake? You can blame it on him if you want, all right? Anyway, yea, hath God said, you have to give, you have to plant doubt in people's minds. Uh, and then Eve adding to the word of God. Blatantly adding to the word of God. Eve is a woman. Women represent churches in the Bible. There are churches. It is in our nature. Even in this church, it is in our nature to want to add to the word of God. We want to add to it, listen to this, this was not God's word. This was Eve's interpretation of God's word. You shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. See, that sounds like something a mom would tell a child. She would tell a child, see that tree? I don't want to catch you eating the fruit out of that tree. Next thing she knows, she looks out, she sees the children playing on that tree. And then she will say, I told you to stay away from that tree. Now get down off that tree and don't you ever climb back up that tree again. That's mama rules. That's not God's rules. God said don't eat it. Mama added to it. It is in our nature, our deprived, wicked nature, to add interpretive things to God's word. And, you, and sometimes they're helps and intended to be helps. But you have to remember, an interpretation of the word is not the word. Amen? My interpretation, me teaching, I mean, I could just read scripture to you this morning, we go home. But I'm trying to get you to understand the sense and comprehend the meaning of each passage as best as I can. But just remember that my interpretation of the word is not the Word of God itself. Picture the Word of God as the meal that you're going to eat. Picture a good teaching of the Word of God as the plate and the fork and the spoon. You have a visitor, Courtney. Yeah. You want candy? Yeah. Mama knows. Her spider senses were tingling. Anyway, okay? They are the plate, the fork, the cup, the spoons that help. But you don't eat the plate, the cup, the fork. You put them down when you're done. They are to aid in eating the Word of God, but they are themselves not the Word of God. Spend more time studying the Word of God and less time studying commentaries of the Word of God. This is what Jesus got into when Jesus upbraided the Pharisees, he said, you have by your traditions made void the commandments of God. Because the Jews added commentaries and then commentaries of the commentaries. And the commentaries of the commentaries were Jewish law, not the law itself. And so they added so many things to the law that it was, un in fact, they'd added so many things to the law that they had loopholes built into it, how they could get by with breaking the law and still think they were honoring God. And this is in our nature. We like to apply rules to people and make them follow. He just loves me. That's what it is. 
Anyway, so um, verse 4. The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He added one word. He added one word to the Bible. Ye shall not surely die. So number one, question it. Number two, adding to it, con contradicting the word of God. For God doth know. Then we have another point. I'll show you this in a minute. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So look up on the screen. I broke this down for you. You might want to write this down somewhere in your notes. And write down, this is commentary, not the Bible. Number one, yea hath God said, questioning the authenticity and authority of God's word. Yea hath God said means, did God really say this? Is this authentic? Okay, I'll give you an example of that here in a little bit. So questioning the authenticity and authority of God's word. Number two, ye shall not surely die. The exact words that God said in Genesis 2 are, thou shalt surely die. So this was a direct contradiction of God's word, meaning that what God said was not true. Because you can't believe both of them. So, look at it like this. Here's the King James. Here's the NIV. The King James says, um, Judah, uh, I can't remember the verses, so I'm not going to give examples. But the King James says one thing in one verse, and the NIV says the exact opposite in the same verse. You have to decide which one you're going to believe. You can't say that both of them can be considered as God's word. You cannot do that. One of them has to be true and one of them has to be a lie. So it's a direct contradiction of God's word. Then number three, for God doth know. Now, he's adding a replacement to God's word, teaching a secret doctrine that God wanted to withhold from you. A secret doctrine. Remember the serpent's more subtle. The serpent did not go to Adam first. He was going to get to Adam all right, but he was going to use Eve to do it. And I want you to think about this. Eve is a woman, and women in the Bible represent what? Churches. Good and bad. So the meaning, here's what I get out of this. The devil will use churches to deceive mankind. Amen? You use churches. Um, so anyway, he has a secret doctrine. He comes in subtly. The tares are sown at night. Not in the daytime. Not while everybody's looking. Um, you have the Most High God. And then you have Satan who says, I will be like the Most High. You have God sitting in his temple. Then you have the man of sin, the son of perdition, as God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. They contradict one another. He's doing it subtly. The Antichrist is never going to appear and say to everybody, Hi, I'm the Antichrist. If you worship me, you'll spend all eternity in hell. Who have I got? Now, believe it or not, in today's world, wouldn't surprise me if some people jumped on board immediately and said, oh, I'm your guy. But he's not going to get everybody that way. And he wants everybody. Everybody. So he comes in subtly with a doctrine that is not in your Bible. I'm going to give you another example of that. In the Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, the rabbis, the Jewish rabbis today, right now, teach this doctrine. That when Moses was on Mount Sinai, that God gave him two sets of laws. One was called the written Torah, which is the Ten Commandments, the dietary, ceremonial, sacrificial laws, the judicial laws, legislative laws, and so on. That was the written law that God gave Moses. But then, 
There is a unwritten law, an oral Torah, they said. God gave it to Moses orally. Moses never wrote it down. Moses then found people worthy to receive this oral Torah. I think it's best I take this off. It's got some kind of emergency on it, and I'm going, what's going on here? So anyway, that Moses received an oral law, he was to never write it down. He was to give it to only a few worthy uh, Levite priests. And then when Moses died, those priests held on to that. And then they gave it orally to the generation below them. And it's been passed down through the centuries. A written law and an unwritten law. Written and spoken, but never written. As I mentioned to you, I read... Um, Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma, 800 and some odd pages worth. Um, I got most of it read. I was preaching revival in Oklahoma, and I was staying at the pastor's house, and there wasn't, I was preaching, it was an all week long revival, and uh, that gave me the opportunity to just sit and read. And I read this thing throughout the whole week. And I was looking for the secret that Masons have. I was reading every page diligently, making notes. And Todd, I got to the end, and I went, where's the secret? They didn't tell me the secret anywhere. I was really disturbed over that. Then I hear that the Masonic uh, Temple in Washington, D.C., they've got a 10,000 uh, volume library of ancient books that you can't just go out and buy in a bookstore. You can't find them anywhere else. They, are, they hold these books, and they're all mystical esoteric books and I thought man I'd like to get in there and read some of those and I thought well I'll, they'll never let me in I'm not a mason so I go and visit that temple in Washington DC and they take me to that library and the, the tour guide is telling us you know people can come anybody can come whether they're a mason or not fill out a request card and they can read any book that's in I went what you mean I can read these books oh yeah you can read these books you know just as long as you don't walk off with them so really so then I deduced that their secret wasn't written in any of those books either. They wouldn't let people read them. Then I got to thinking, wait a minute. They didn't write it down. They didn't write it down anywhere. So you can read all the books you want to. They're not afraid because they didn't write it down anywhere. It's a secret doctrine. What does that mean? It means the bell rang. Got to go. Okay. But under uh, the Mormon church has secret rituals that man cannot see. Catholic church has secret proceedings, secret doctrines that most people cannot be a part of. You name the religion, and I promise you, at, in the top levels in the hierarchy, there are secret doctrines, secret teachings, secret meetings, that, are, that will never, according to them, never see the light of day. And they can't just go out and tell everybody what these secrets are. We have to know whether you are worthy enough to receive it before we can tell. What that means is, we got to know that we have sufficiently scared you into believing that we will, in fact, cut your throat from ear to ear, which is part of their ritual. That if you divulge this secret, we will kill you. And so, for the most part, people who belong to secret societies, people who belong to these mystery cults, these mystery organizations, they don't tell about what goes on in the secret meetings. They don't tell you the truth about what all their symbols mean. They don't tell you the truth about the, th the phrases that they use and so on. They don't tell you the truth. God tells us, and we have it in no uncertain terms, exactly who God is, where God is, what God is, everything that's knowable about God is contained in His Word, and it's there for anybody to read. Whereas mystery cults will have a picture or a symbol or a statue. And that statue will represent a 
part of that secret doctrine somehow, but unless you know the symbols and unless you know the truth behind it, you'll never figure it out. Tarot cards. Tarot cards, have one of them has a picture of a tower on it, one has a picture of a joker on it. There's one uh, tarot card that has a, a man hanging upside down by one leg, and his, his legs are crossed sort of like that. And there's nothing written on these cards about what exactly that is and what it means. And if you go online and type in tarot card meanings, you can find a thousand websites and all of them will have something different to say about each one of those cards. Nothing firm, nothing static, nothing unchangeable, nothing that's totally knowable. Why did they have to speak in symbols? Why did they have to speak in secret? What is it that they're trying to hide? Amen? That's the devil's religion. The devil wants you to be part of his church, his religion. The process that he uses to get you there starts with, Yea, hath God said. That's how it starts. You've got to question your Bible or believe that the stories and the things that are in the Bible are not really true. Manley Hall wrote a book called Secret Teachings of All Ages and he read the Bible cover to cover. But Manley Hall says that the vast majority of the things said in the Bible and written in the Bible are not real sayings and they're not real events. They are allegorical, meaning that they never happened, but there is a secret teaching behind each one of them. Okay? I'm going to give you one more thing and I'm going to let you go. The Hebrew letters. The Hebrew alphabet. Who in here can read Hebrew? Anybody? I can't. Can you read it? Can you read the words? I'm going to make you stand up if you say yes. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Okay. The Kabbalists say that every Hebrew letter is a picturegram. And that it's a symbol for something. And that every Hebrew letter has its own hidden secret meaning. And you can take a Hebrew word and take the meanings of the letters and add them together to make this little story and these letters and the pictures of these letters will teach you a secret doctrine number one that's not in the Bible and there is nothing in the Bible that says the Hebrew letters are pictograms and they have their own little secret meaning much less the Bible telling you what the meaning of these letters put in word form are see that's part of the oral Torah there's the written Torah where it says God says thou shall not steal the Kabbalists, the Jewish rabbis, when they look at that verse, they don't say to themselves, that must mean God tells us, thou shalt not steal. Then, then accordingly, we should not steal. That does not mean that to them. What it means to them is the secret teachings that are in the letter symbols. They put that together, and that's the mystery doctrine. That's the oral Torah that Moses came down from the mountain with. God never said those things. God never said them. Amen? Stay away. If God doesn't say it, you shouldn't believe it. Amen. Father in heaven, help us. Lord, This we are surrounded in this world by the subtlety of Satan. He's using churches. He's using ministries. He's using seminaries and colleges. He's using YouTube teachers, Facebook popes, Seminaries. He's using all of these things, Lord, to deceive people. And Father, you teach us that the way to not be deceived is just believe every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And Father, we believe these words are written down in this book for us, and that's why we regard it as high as we do. Father, we endeavor to learn as much as we possibly can from the pages of this book. And Father, help us not as Eve, Help us to not be beguiled by the serpent and fall away from the truth. Bless your word and bless these people, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.